are, are watching online tonight. We're delighted that you're joining us for the first in a series of events held by VT Digger as part of our Fast Forward series. I'm Ann Galloway, founder and editor of VT Digger, which is now in its 10th year. <laughs> The Fast Forward series is an extension of our mission-driven nonprofit journalism at VT Digger. As the state's only online nonprofit news organization, we seek to get past the sound bites and spin to explore issues that have a direct impact on Vermonters. Vermont's at a crossroads. As a state, we face a number of structural problems, and those issues are magnified as we address the impact of climate change, demographic shifts, and globalization. Ironically, the rise of social media has deepened our differences instead of bringing us together around practical solutions. That's why, over the next year, VT Digger is bringing people together with different points of view on public records, vaping, climate change, and the impact of racial discrimination on the state's population base. The purpose of the Fast Word series is to give Vermonters an opportunity to sort through the complexities of these issues and see how local, state, and national leaders have used system change for the public good. Tonight's fast forward discussion topic is how to fix a jail. Many thanks to our sponsors, the ACLU of Vermont and the UVM College of Arts and Sciences. Please give them a round of applause. A seven days investigation in December has thrust the issue of how the state treats people who are incarcerated onto center stage. The report revealed allegations of staff misconduct and drug use at the state's only women's prison, spanning a period of years. The problems at the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility, which houses 130 women, appear to be systemic in other prisons and around the state. VT Digger has reported on similar issues in Newport, and we have sued over public records and the demotion of the former superintendent of Southern State Correctional Facility, who has been accused of sexual harassment. The reporting has spurred an internal investigation at the Department of Corrections. Advocates are calling for the closure of Chittenden Regional, reforms to pretrial detention, and better transitional housing. About 140 of 1,700 people in Vermont have already served the minimum portion of their prison term but for lack of appropriate housing, they remain incarcerated. Another 400 are people who have been detained prior to trial. Vermont's problems aren't unique. Prisons nationwide are places where physical and sexual abuse are, is rampant and rehabilitation support is sometimes an after, afterthought. Tonight, we will have a keynote from a nationally recognized advocate for criminal justice reform, a 45-minute panel, with state correctional system experts, and finally, brief remarks from two lawmakers who are advancing justice reinvestment initiatives. Reader questions will be taken up as part of the panel. Right now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Janos Martin, who led the Close Rikers campaign in New York City and managed state campaigns for the ACLU's Smart Justice Initiative. Martin is now running for Manhattan District Attorney on a justice reform platform Please welcome Janos Martin. Good evening. Good evening. All right, thank you, Anne, and to the whole Digger team. Now I'm just going to pull up my speech. It's on an app that I downloaded for the first time. Uh, let's just see if I can get this. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> So thank you so much for having me. It's, it's really great to come up from New York today. Uh, I've been asked to give some context to the national criminal justice movement and my work on the Close Rikers campaign, as well as other efforts to close or transform jails around the country. And I'll start at the outset by saying, as somebody who works on national criminal justice issues, Vermont does have some things to be proud of. Um, Vermont has one of the lowest incarceration rates in the country. Uh, as you know, along with Maine, it is the only place where people who are incarcerated in prison can vote, which is something that many states are now trying to change. You've got great advocates like the ACLU here in Vermont who have been doing really great work. And you have a, one of the country's most forward-thinking uh, state attorneys, Sarah George, 
who you'll be hearing from later. So, you know, not all, is, not all is terrible in Vermont, but as we heard, there are some issues that have been going on. And the reality is that there is no such thing as a jail and prison system in the United States that is working the way it needs to. And so when we think about what the lessons we learned in New York from the Close Rikers campaign and what other advocates have been working on around the country, there is still plenty for Vermont to do. And we're going to hear a lot about what different people are working on in the panel that comes after this speech. But first, let me pick up this clicker. You can skip that. All right. The Close Rikers campaign. So let me tell you how this campaign came to be. So for me, the story starts in New York in the 1990s where I was growing up as a teenager. That was a time when Mayor Giuliani was our mayor, unfortunately. And it led to a lot of uh, police interactions with young people of color, particularly, particularly young men of color, that were very aggressive, very problematic. Uh, the term stop and frisk eventually came to describe what happened to a lot of uh, those interactions, but essentially, you know, as a young man, I was stopped and frisked, arrested, put in jail, along with thousands and thousands of other uh, young people growing up in New York at that time. And so while I never went to Rikers as a young man, I certainly knew a lot of people who did. And so criminal justice was forefront of my mind as I went off to college and became an organizer, came home to law school, went to Fordham Law School and became a civil rights attorney. And it was very early in my career that I did get to see Rikers Island for the first time. Now, Rikers Island is not a jail. It is a jail complex. If you see, it is an entire island right by LaGuardia Airport with 10 different jails. It has its own laundry mat and industrial dining and everything you need to sustain a city of thousands of people who are incarcerated. And in the 1990s, there were as many as 22,000 people locked up on Rikers Island. Uh, it is a place that for 80 years, since it opened in the 30s, has been just a cesspool of violence and corruption. Uh, for every generation or so, New Yorkers would try to appoint some blue ribbon commission to reform it, but nothing would ever seem to work. Within years, things would be back to uh, what Preparara, who I hear uh, was here not too long ago, uh, called a Lord of the Flies condition uh, when he put a federal monitor on Rikers Island in 2014. So people have tried to reform Rikers before, but nobody ever tried to close it. And um, as somebody who had gone there and seen when 600 young kids were, 16, 17 year olds were locked up there uh, as part of a program that I used to run, I knew that I wanted to be part of whatever campaign was going to close Rikers Island. So I reached out to the founder of that campaign, and within a couple of days, um, I had given my notice at work, working on police oversight for the government, and joined the Close Rikers campaign as its director. Uh, now, over the this is the beginning of 2016. Now, there's a couple things that we did as a campaign that I think are applicable to anybody trying to affect change in the criminal justice space. First and foremost, we organized people directly impacted by criminal justice. It was essential for us to be in communities that had been most harmed by policing, by mass incarceration, by problems with the parole system, and these are the people who are most invested in changing the system. So that's where our organizers would spend their time. Those are the people who we'd bring into the circle, uh, make leaders of the campaign, be our public spokespeople uh, at rallies across the city. Number two, we had to reframe the concept of who is in jail and prison. I actually feel like America has come a pretty long way in the last years on this, but when we started the Close Rikers campaign, there was this sense that everybody in jail must be some dangerous, horrible person, and that's why they're at Rikers. When in fact, 80% of the people who were at Rikers were there simply because they were too poor to afford bail before they'd been convicted of any crime. And that was a, a, a long reframing that we had to do to get New Yorkers to understand who was really at Rikers. And the people who were able to teach New York about that were the people who had been locked up there, were the mothers and the fathers who visited their children every week and were trying to explain to the rest of the city that what was going on was unjust. We also kept constant pressure on the mayor, who in this case um, was responsible for the administration of the jail. You see this picture, it's one of my favorites. This is a rally where we took a thousand people and marched across Queens to the foot of the Rikers Island Bridge. We also did rallies at City Hall, sort of conventional protests, but then we also were using innovative digital tactics to make sure that people on social media could understand what was wrong with Rikers and what we were trying to do in the process of closing it. Um, and sometimes we did more small-scale creative tactics. For example, the mayor had said that uh, there was no way to close Rikers, there was no plan, even though we had written one. 
So we knew that he has this routine of working out at the same gym every Friday morning. So we got a couple of our members, gym memberships there, and, uh, and presented him with our plan. And uh, somebody took a video of it, and it actually led the news because the mayor, turns out, works out in cargo shorts. And <laughs> the story ended up going viral for that reason. But uh, around paragraph three, it said, you know, the reason that he was on video is because Close Rikers activists were pressuring him about a plan. And so, uh, several months after that, the mayor did commit uh, to closing Rikers. And as of last fall, the city council voted, and Rikers Island is on its way to closure. Now, anybody in this room who's ever worked on policy knows that you can have the best policies in the world, but that's not what wins hearts and minds. You have to lead with story, with what's going on with real people. So that's why I saved policy sort of for the end of what we did in the Close Rikers campaign. But the reality is you can't close Rikers without changing policy. And we knew that, and we actually had a set of policies that we were pushing along the way. So, for example, I mentioned that you know, early in my career, I saw that there were 600 16- and 17-year-olds at Rikers Island. Uh, now that we've passed raised the age in 2018, so the adult age of responsibility is 18, there are zero kids on Rikers Island or anywhere in New York City jails because that's no longer allowed under state law. So, we also passed bail reform, which uh, a lot of states are working on. I actually don't know what the state is in Vermont, but in New York, we were actually able to get one of the best bail laws in the country uh, passed last year. And what that means is that if you are now charged with a misdemeanor or a nonviolent, most nonviolent felonies, uh, you cannot be held uh, on money bail pre-trial, which means that you cannot be jailed for the crime of poverty when your guilt has yet to be proven. And as a result of that, that was just implemented on January 1st of this year. And because of that, we now have the fewest number of pre-trial detainees in New York State jails since the 1970s. And then the last set of policy reforms are around discovery and speedy trial, which is a problem in almost every state. It's why, why are these cases taking so long to, to actually get to trial? And, and will they ever get to trial? And if not, is that un, unfortunate leverage on a defendant to accept a plea deal just to get it over with or to resolve their situation? So we've passed discovery and uh, speedy trial reform also. Those also took effect January 1st. So we don't know if they've worked yet, uh, but we hope that they will continue to drive the number of people in jail and prison down further. So, you know, as we were doing this in New York, people were reaching out around the country asking how they could, how they could do this in their own jurisdictions. Uh, the next place we went is Milwaukee. So, um, I, I've been told that uh, the issue of parole revocation is a, is a problem in Vermont. It's actually a problem everywhere in the United States. The issue of when people come home from prison, they face all kinds of challenges, and in addition to the regular challenges of where to live, how to get a job, they also have to abide by certain rules in addition to abiding the law that makes it very difficult just to live your daily life. And when people fail to comply with those rules, they often have their parole revoked. This is a prison in Milwaukee, uh, downtown Milwaukee, that is entirely consists of people who are in prison for parole revocations. So these are not people who have committed new crimes while they're on parole, that they've broken rules like curfew, driving when they're not supposed to, being in the presence of another known felon, things of that nature. And so there's 800 people in this facility. And what's crazy is that, uh, what's crazy about this photo is that these windows aren't even actually uh, to any of their cells. They're actually just into the hallways or in some cases for show to make it more palatable for downtown Milwaukee commercial business district. Um, and so activists in Milwaukee are trying to close MSDF and they're having a difficult time, um, but with the Democratic Convention coming to Milwaukee, they're hoping to spotlight this issue uh, for a party that claims to be for criminal justice reform. So in Philadelphia, some better news. Um, Larry Krasner, who many of you have heard of, I'm sure, is the district attorney there. He ran on an unabashedly reform platform. And we had started a campaign to close the creek, which was the oldest continuing running major jail in American city. Um, it had been running for about 100 years. And within a few months of Larry Krasner taking office, uh, the mayor called us. He's like, you actually can just stop your campaign. We're going to close it because we don't have as many people in jail. Philadelphia used to have four jails, and now it has three. Um, there's, it's the jail population since Larry Krasner took over less than two years ago has gone down by about 30%. And that's just by using the district attorney's office to be more sensible about who, uh, who we're incarcerating. Finally, in St. Louis, 
closed the workhouse. It's, the name of the jail is actually the workhouse, and it's a throwback to a different time and place in our country's history, but I, I consider it to be maybe the worst jail in the country, and St. Louis activists, many of whom were first sort of born into activism by Ferguson, have now rallied together to close this jail. St. Louis has two jails. They're trying to make the argument that if you implement bail reform and invest in the community, you actually don't need a two, you can only have one. And so they're, there were once 1,000 people in the workhouse, there's now about 200, and they're hoping if they keep going with their reforms, they can eliminate the need for the workhouse by the end of this year. So that's some of the work that's going on around the country. Um, there's a through line for each of these. And, you know, Vermont is a different place than St. Louis, which is a different place than Philadelphia. Um, but the through line is that what advocates in each of these places are calling for is to think about how we can be focusing our investments in things like mental health care, in things like substance treatment for people suffering with substance use disorder, how we can get young people jobs in the legal economy, especially if they're currently in the illegal economy. Um, and th these are things that every city and state can do better. Uh, and w what it does is it'll stop the cycle of harm from happening. Uh, and mentioned that I'm running for Manhattan District Attorney. I'm running very much on a platform of using jail and prison as a last resort. Now I know there's, there's people um, who I think correctly are arguing that we should get to a place where we don't need jails and prisons in society and we're a step away from there now. But the way we get there is by recognizing that when a crime happens, it's usually because there's an underlying harm that's been unaddressed. And we can be doing a lot more as a society to address those harms, doing them in the community before somebody gets caught up in the criminal legal system. But you know, when it gets, if it gets that far, we have an opportunity to turn back, to get somebody into treatment, to get somebody mental health care, to get somebody a job. And in doing so, we can significantly reduce the number of people in prison and jail. And so I would say to, to those of you here working here in Vermont to change the system, you know, you're starting again from a decent place. You're not starting with the workhouse. At least, it, maybe, maybe you are actually. I, I read the article, it was, it was pretty grim. But, but honestly, you have a lot of champions for criminal justice reform in your government, and you have a lot of great advocates. You're starting from a good place. But to give perspective, even though Vermont is the first or second lowest incarceration rate in the United States, if it were taken alone as a country, it would be in the bottom 10% of the world. It would be actually sandwiched, I looked this up, it would be sandwiched right between Russia and Brazil, uh, two famous criminal justice reform jurisdictions. Um, so, so think about that when you think about how much farther Vermont can push to, uh, to create a system that actually puts people first, strengthens communities, and re reduces our dependence on jails and prisons. Thank you. Thank you, Giannis. Our panelists are coming up to the stage and I'll introduce them here in a second. Oh yeah. Thank you very much. Um, from left uh, to right, we have uh, on the first panelist is Ashley Messier. She's the Vermont organizer for the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. She was previously imprisoned at Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility and later served as the Smart Justice Organizer for the ACLU of Vermont. Messier is also Executive Director of the Women's Freedom and Justice Initiative. Her years of community organizing and direct experience with the criminal justice system inform her approach to av advocacy. In the middle, we have Jim Baker, the interim commissioner of the Vermont Department of Corrections and former Vermont State Police Director. Baker worked for the State Police for more than 30 years, serving as director from 2006 to 2009. He was recently named commissioner of corrections on an interim basis following the resignation of former commissioner of Corrections, Michael Touchette, who stepped down after the seven days expose on systemic corruption in the Chittenden State Correctional Facility. Baker has been charged with helping to lead the state's response. Kathy Fox conducts research on offender reentry programs in the state of Vermont, notably the Circles of Support and Accountability program that pairs formerly incarcerated individuals with volunteer supporters. 
In the spring of 2013, she was awarded a Fulbright Senior Scholar Award to compare offender reintegration in the United States and New Zealand. She is an Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences at UVM and launched the UVM Liberal, Liberal Arts in Prison program that offers credit-bearing courses in two Vermont prisons. Sarah George was appointed as Vermont State's Attorney for Chittenden County in January 2017 by Governor Phil Scott. Before that, she had worked in Vermont State's Attorney's Office since 2011 after graduating from the Vermont Law School. As a prosecutor, George has promised to work toward reform and equity in the criminal justice system. And last but not least, we have Alan Keyes, our criminal justice reporter for VT Digger, and he and I will co-moderate the panel. Thank you all again for joining us. And uh, the first question is for Ashley. Uh, why did it take an expose from seven days detailing sexual misconduct and drug use by DOC staff to prompt a state investigation into the South Burlington facility? Well, that's a big question. <clears throat> uh, I would say in two parts, uh, one, was the bravery of the women that were willing to tell their story publicly and be named very publicly. Uh, the second was uh, Paul Hines was very dedicated to researching the information uh, and to telling the story in a way that uh, signified their dignity and respect for the women. Uh, and we have also been screaming these types of allegations for decades in this state and in that facility and in other facilities that the women have lived in, in Vermont. And unfortunately, we were not shocked and appalled by the article as the general community, as some other advocates were. Uh, we very much felt like it's about time. Okay. And uh, to Paul and the women's benefit, it did spark large community outrage. It did spark uh, the internal investigation, which we're hoping will be deep and detailed and bring a level of honesty and accountability to the system. And, and Jim, now that you've been in your position for a, a few weeks now. Um, <laughs> He's counting the hours. <laughs> four, four and a half weeks, Alan. <laughs> what have you found out about the culture of the Department of Corrections and what changes from your kind of first view um, do you think should be implemented? Well, I, th I think to answer that question right off, I would say that corrections has an insular culture. Um, it's also a clashing of cultures in the organization um, due to a lot of issues. There is transformation happening. And I, I recognize what Ashley said. I know before I was approached about being the interim commissioner, obviously I was concerned about the article as well. As a resident of Vermont and someone who's been active in the criminal justice system in Vermont for 40 years. Um, I think the clashing of cultures is this transition that's happening inside corrections that folks may not see from the outside, but it's happening at the legislature this year to a new uh, role for corrections. And um, there are folks inside corrections, for example, that believe that change shouldn't happen. There's folks that are ready for the change. There's folks that are kind of in the middle. And we see that uh, culture play out in everyday interactions that we have with folks that we're responsible for. And so that's, that's an early observation. Um, obviously, changing culture is not a simple process. Um, identifying the areas where you change is important, and that's the process we're undergoing right now. Can you just briefly talk about the morale that you saw when you first walked in and talked to people in corrections? Alan, I think you were in some committee hearings that I testified to. Um, the staff is demoralized. Um, look, th there's 1,100 employees in corrections. And the folks that surround me and the leadership team are some of the hardest working, dedicated folks that I've been around. Systems create behaviors. And I'm not a corrections person. You heard my background. I'm a law enforcement person. That may scare some folks in the room, but um, I, I did work in D.C. for three years, and I had a front row seat for criminal justice reform during the Obama administration. 
I understand it. Um, the staff, um, I think, is, is starting to realize that we're getting stabilized. But in the facilities, staff are working mandatory overtime. We're carrying large vacancies. I'm hearing stories of staff working uh, 16 and 18 hours, sleeping in their vehicles for four and five hours, and going back to work in 18-hour shifts. That is not sustainable. It's dangerous for the staff. It's dangerous for the folks that we're responsible for in the facilities. So to answer your question, that's a major challenge right now. And um, we're gonna address that with a graduation of a class on Friday of 32 people. And um, we have to address that issue before we start trying to address the issues around culture, if that helps with your question. Thank you, Sarah. Many inmates on furlough end up returning to the facility for technical violations, similar to what Janos was talking about in New York. And the Council of State Governments tracked furlough violations in 2019 and found that 77% of the people readmitted to prison committed technical violations. These can include losing housing, violating curfews, programmer work failures, and using drugs and alcohol. Should the current furlough system be scrapped? If so, how should it be replaced? <laughs> also a very big question. Uh, the short answer is yes, it should absolutely be scrapped. Um, I recently learned as well that the Department of Corrections has 32 different levels of supervision um, within furlough, which you can imagine for an individual um, re-entering the community how hard that must be to keep track of for themselves, but then to be dragged back in on a technical violation as if somebody having a positive drug test or being out past curfew or maybe losing their approved housing that somehow we think putting them in jail is a better um, use of our money, for one, and um, their own safety or the safety of their families, the instability that that creates far outweighs any, I think, public safety risk of bringing them back to jail. Um, what should we replace it with? I think, one, we just need to put less people in jail um, so that that's not an option at all, especially people who have those family dynamics or supports in the community to take them away from those is again making all of us less safe um, but it just a system that's very clear i think is important and a system that when prosecutors recommend a sentence and when a judge imposes a sentence everybody knows what to expect from that and right now that's not happening Prosecutors are agreeing to sentences thinking one thing and then it's turning out that that person's serving significantly longer jail sentences than anybody intended. Um, and that's not fair to anybody in the system. I also think that we need a system that allows people who are incarcerated to have more impact or more um, contacts with their family and support systems in the community either uh, literally allowing them out for birthdays or for parent-teacher conferences or for funerals or weddings, things that can really help stabilize them and make reentry a lot easier for them. Why are people staying in longer than you anticipate? For those same reasons. They're, they might not be originally staying in longer. They're getting out at their minimums, but then being yanked back in over and over again for technical violations. And so someone who might have been sentenced to a six-month sentence is actually serving over two years, um, which is when I reviewed all of the women that are be currently being held out of Chittenden County cases, that was a handful of them, that they had actually ended up serving literally years longer than we ever expected them to on technical violations. Wow, I wonder if, um, Kathy, you have any comment on this particular problem? It's on. <laughs> it's already on. Uh, it's on. Okay, um, on the furlough problem specifically? Yeah, or? technical violations. Technical and, violations. Yeah. Um, well, there are many states or some states who uh, have uh, eliminated, um, by law, they've said that you can't be returned for a technical violation. And, you know, I think th that would make a great deal of sense. Um, Vermont is, as far as I know, the only state that still even has this furlough conditional release status. Um, I, I in, anecdotally, I know that it's a, a failure for many, many people going back. I spent a lot of time in the women's prison and they go back for um, 
small violations. Um, there are other places that don't do that. Um, and I, I think when, when you think about the public safety piece of it, it, it it's not, uh, it doesn't pass muster. It, it costs a fortune and um, I just, I can't see any legal or, or ethical justification for it. What are some of the best practices that other states use? For reentry? Yeah, for reentry. Um, well, all states have gotten better around reentry in the last 20 years. They used to just open the door and give somebody 50 bucks and wish them well. And uh, so now we have all this support around housing and employment and uh, some substance use treatment, um, all kinds of things like that. But essentially, we've created an infrastructure of reentry that is designed to solve a problem that we actually created by m mass incarceration. And so to me, I think the, I, I do study reentry and I'm very interested in it, but I think focusing on how to do reentry well is a problem because so many of the problems they face are a result of being incarcerated. So collateral consequences, stigma around getting jobs, housing, the financial, uh, impact of being incarcerated for a length of time. So I think we need to be more judicious about who we incarcerate and for how long. But that said, um, the ones that are doing it well, and Vermont does some pieces of this well, um, they certainly have tried really hard in the last several years, but um, it, it's job skill training that people will actually translate to a kind of job that they could get. Um, education, higher ed is one of the best investments you can have in terms of um, reducing recidivism. Um, and housing, so I, I think one of the main things Vermont could do is eliminate this housing uh, approval requirement. And, th th um, and then the, uh, the final thing I would say is that when you look at places and people who have succeeded, they all, uh, there's a very similar theme, which is someone believed in me and thought that I could succeed and thought that I could be more than the worst thing I ever did. And uh, so I think if we change the culture of supervision, um, reduce supervision, but then change the culture around it so that we hold um, uh, correctional staff and others responsible for helping people move along a more positive path that, rather than playing gotcha, uh, you, uh, you were smoking marijuana or something like that. Um, eliminating furlough, institute, presumptive parole, and, um, and then I think changing the culture of supervision. Jim, what do you think of those ideas? Listen, I can't disagree with anything that was said. Um, we're working with the legislature now. You know, I, I think, I, I just want to be careful about when people are left with the impression that it's corrections that created the 32, 32 different yeah. furloughs. It was the legislature that did it. And they did it, they did it. No, Senator, let me, let me bail you out there. Um, they did it thinking they were fixing furlough along the way when it made it more complicated. And you know, the housing thing is a very challenging situation. And we, we recognize that. Ashley and I were talking about this beforehand. You know, um, when you hear in Vermont all the time that there's this housing crunch and there's a 1% vacancy, um, the type of folks that, that we are trying to manage back into the community are very complicated individuals. Uh, they've, got, they've got some very large challenges that we're managing back. And, and my, you know, this point about um, 10 years ago, some folks in the room may know this better than me, getting into the business of corrections now. But 10 years ago, we used to supervise about 12,000 people in the community. We supervise about seven now. And that's because of all the good work that's been done collectively on offloading um, the folks that shouldn't be in jail or shouldn't be on furlough. And so, um, you know, the jail population was up, it's down. Now the trends are showing that it could go up if we don't do some work to, to turn that around. The challenges around housing aren't as simple as finding housing. Finding housing for folks that have very complicated backgrounds, who have burned a lot of bridges in their life, who don't have support networks, is a very challenging uh, situation. And we recognize it. Before I got the corrections, they've been working on it. Um, I've had a conversation with staff today 
about an idea, how we can collectively look at this and bring in stakeholders to help us solve the problem. Because this is not just corrections, this problem. The problem is in the communities where people don't want, for example, a sex offender living next to them. And we have to soften the communities to understand that this is just not corrections responsibility, to move someone from a good inmate to a good citizen. And it's just not our responsibility. It's a joint responsibility that we need to share. And I think that's the important point, Anne. Thank you, Jim. Ashley, the Council of State Governments has also found that under DOC's transitional housing program, approximately 20% of beds at any given time go unused. And some DOC clients are denied entry based on past violations or program agree agreements. The result is prisoners who could be eligible for release remaining behind bars. Also, the number of transitional beds for women inmates has been reduced in recent months. What steps does the state need to take to address the problems with transitional housing for prisoners in Vermont? Yes, <clears throat> so more specifically, uh, women lost over 50 transitional housing beds uh, in the last two years with nothing to replace them. Uh, and housing remains a problem for uh, incarcerated people regardless of gender placement throughout our system. And so, you know, in looking at uh, reform measures, we really need to start looking at the programs that, that Corrections is funding, and Jim and I were talking about this earlier. Uh, when we know in 2020 that relapse is part of recovery and you have programs that are kicking people out for even their very first relapse, uh, that doesn't really address the problem and creates further harm. And so um, I think they're really looking at the programs we're funding, uh, looking for the community to step up and stakeholders to step up and really be a part of the conversation on how we can create new housing opportunities looking for landlords and people that own their homes and however innovative we need to get. Housing is a problem for everyone in Vermont across the board, regardless of your background or challenges or life or income. Um, and so it's, it's a complicated issue. That being said, you know, it's, uh, Kathy mentioned, you know, our problem of mass incarceration. And if we weren't incarcerating these people in the first place, that would change the conversation a lot. Right, they would have more opportunity, they would be able to have gainful employment, be with their families and children and parent. And so it's, it's a symptom of a larger issue. Uh, Ashley, how, how do you convince communities to embrace tra having traditional housing in their communities? Well, that's really a sticking point, I think. Uh, Yanos did a good job talking about what it's like to work uh, in hyper-local communities. Uh, I've done this work nationally as well as uh, throughout the entire state of Vermont. And uh, just like with the rest of the country, Vermont is grappling with the how do we respond to harm. So you may believe in criminal justice reform until it happens to your daughter or your husband or it's your home that got broken into. And then that's where the conversation stalls a lot. And so it's really about how do we respond to intimate partner violence? How do we respond to harm against property? How do we respond to harm against each other? Um, and until we can have some really cultural conversations around harm and the way that it impacts us, and when communities can start to learn to respond to harm differently in ways that we know are healing and build accountability and build real human justice, not much is going to change. Sarah, what, what role do prosecutors play in helping ensure a successful reentry for a person? Yeah, what role do prosecutors play in helping to ensure a successful reentry for a person? As far as can they help with sentencing or how yeah. they structure? So, I mean, generally speaking, prosecutors could do the opposite of every single thing they currently do, and that would help. Um, we, are, we are a major part of the problem, and I think that helping with reentry, you know, to Kathy's point, um, we need to help a lot, like way before we get to reentry. I think that we need to be arresting less people, we need to be charging less people, we need to be diverting more people, we need to be detaining um, less people before they're 
um, found guilty, we need to be engaging them in more services while their case is pending, um, which I think a couple of our pretrial services monitors are here. I have to give them a shout out because since we've been engaging far more people in services while their case is pending, we've had to put far less on supervision. Um, we've put an incredibly lower amount of people on probation because we've already gotten out of out of their charge what we needed and um, don't need that conviction, don't need that supervision, and then putting even less in jail. And you know, again, to Kathy's point, once we're putting them in jail, if that really is the route we have to take, putting them in jail for far less time. Um, we have this idea that we need this sort of minimum time and then we have this maximum, and that maximum is so arbitrary and like we've seen, it's ended up just keeping people in jail, jail longer. And you know, 90% of the people that we incarcerate in Vermont get out. Um, we have a very small number of people that we put in for life. Um, too many, but we have far fewer than, um, we have a very few amount that do. So we need to be working from the very get-go to have less people in the system. And then re-entry-wise, um, I think to my point earlier, we need to do a better job while they're incarcerated with, with already getting them um, to be a part of the community, already helping them get to their kids' um, um, parent conferences and go to things for their family that might be important for them and connect them to a community so that when they get out, it's not all foreign to them. And when it's foreign to somebody, they're at a higher risk of getting pulled back in. What, what kind of crime should land people in jail? <laughs> um, you know, it, the irony is that some of the more violent offenses in our community are actually people that are less likely to reoffend. So um, it really, that's a really hard question. I think that including homicide, most of the people that commit homicide will never commit another homicide, even if they were let out. The, the, it, that particular crime is very particular. It's in, you know, for a particular particular reason. Um, in my personal opinion, I even try to stay away from the idea that violent um, felonies are really the only ones because I think that, again, those people are the ones with the most trauma in their history, are usually the ones with bigger mental health issues that led to that violence in the first place. They're usually victims themselves. Um, so th there's very few, I think, left that require incarceration, um, especially when you know, I always think about it as, if you imagine spending, imagine, I did it, 50 plus thousand dollars a year on college, and you know that when you get out, you're gonna have a 32% um, chance of getting a job. And then you pay another $60,000, and you have the same ability. And then next thing you know, you're, you know, you're $200,000 in the debt, and you, you're, you still might not get a job. That's our incarceration, that's our Department of Corrections. It's $69,000 a year and they're 67% likely to reoffend. What are we doing? Why are we doing that? A um, lot less people need to be in there for um, whatever the crime is. Thank you. Jim, what do you think? <laughs> Jim, what do you think? What crime should land people in jail? You know, you're, you're asking me a question of of um, now that I sit in a different seat, and I think Sarah's point that she sits in a different seat. Um, I, you know, I'm going to differ in an opinion that there are individuals in our system that need to be in jail um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, I do agree that um, we corrections need to do our part in the system to do a better job of making sure that we're not doing more harm to the situation than there needs to be um, on these offenses where we put folks back in on technical violations. Um, I, I do have to push a little bit back against technical violations because, you know, I've looked at some of these cases and sometimes they look like a housing situation, but underneath them there's, there's self-harm going on. And because of the lack of resources that are built out in the community, many times we have little choice we, we're down to little choices about what we're going to do with that individual. And I think that's part of the system that needs to be looked at very closely, which is, and the, and the work is going on at the State House now, about what, are, what services are in the community. And I go back to what I said earlier. 
And some of this comes back from my background as the police chief in Rutland, where we created Project Vision. And the work that we did, <coughs> the work that we did around working with the community to help on these very issues about how you um, soften the landing for individuals coming out. They need a lot of help to transition. So I, I don't really want to get into the deba debate with, with Sarah about who should be in jail and who shouldn't be in jail, um, especially in my role now, because I, I've said this a couple times in front of committees, and I, I want to emphasize this as a call out to the correction staff. How, how many correction staff folks are here tonight? Raise your hands. Thank you for what you do. <laughs> You know, when I was a police officer, I'd sit in court in a sentencing. I'd hear the judge say, you are sentenced to the, to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections. And now I am the Commissioner of Corrections. Mm -hmm. And I take that role very, very seriously. There's at least one person here who came up to me earlier whose son's in jail. And I told her I take my role very seriously. I'm obligated to protect her son. And I'm also obligated to, to help my staff do the best absolute job they can do. And so these conversations about who should be in jail, who shouldn't be in jail, are very tricky conversations. But I think for the Department of Corrections, where we want to be is in a situation where we're moving to a more humane, dignified process, and that everybody's treated in a fair and impartial way. And that there is no, there is no um, systematic situations that allow people to use that power and control against individuals that they shouldn't be using it against. So I know I didn't really answer the question because I don't want to be in the debate, but I want to give you a sense of where Corrections is long before I got here under the leadership of Mike Touchette. Um, when I met with Mike, he left me with two words, dignity and respect. And I made a commitment to him that I would follow through with that as the Commissioner of Corrections during my interim time. So what should happen with Chittenden Regional? Should we close it, Kathy? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> um, that facility <clears throat> is not ideal. Um, it's not ideal for women. It's not ideal for humans. Um, yes, I think it should be closed. I, I don't think, uh, architecture is only one piece of it. it it's obviously culture. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't provide an environment in which someone can easily make progress, right? Um, and, but n no prisons do that I've seen in the United States. Um, so I, I would definitely like to see a different facility, much smaller. I mean, the bottom line is that the vast majority of the women there could be effectively supervised in the community and don't need to be there. Um, that said, um, we, uh, my partner Abby Crocker and I, research partner, we are um, the research partners on an Urban Institute grant that Vermont just got, um, which was uh, in process long before the Seven Days article came out. And it was initiated by Mike Touchette, who said, I want to change our culture um, in prisons. I, and I want to try a pilot, and so we're, we're doing this. And part of what we've done is go look at other facilities. So just as an example, there's a facility in Maine where um, you know, there's natural light. People can go outside. Um, there's windows. Uh, they don't have slamming doors. Uh, they, they don't um, get sent to something bad if they have a, a dirty UA. They say, oh, you need more support. What can we do to support you? Because relapse is part of recovery. And so, you know, when you see this model, then you realize there are other ways we could do this rather than having these incredibly frightening, slamming doors, you know? So, I, I, yes, I think they should close it, um, but I think it's not just a question of moving the women to a different facility. We need to do the entire enterprise differently and start from scratch. So, Ashley, what are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Does Vermont even need a women's prison? Does Vermont even need a women's prison? There's people who have been saying abolish the prison. Okay, so can the people in the back hear me? I just wanna, okay, cool. 
So uh, at the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, we work to end the incarceration of women and girls, period. The, the reality is, is I've lived at CRCF. I do work in that facility still. I know pretty much most of the women uh, that are sitting there tonight. And I can tell you that I would be fine with pretty much any one of them living next door to my children. Because the reality is that the, the population we serve specifically to the women in our state right now, over 80% of them are, their crimes were committed out of trauma, out of poverty, out of lack of resources, out of addiction, all of which are better served in, in the community. There's no question. These are primary parents. These are women who have been victims of domestic and sexual violence and human trafficking. No one heals in a jail cell. I think Bobby Sands is in the audience and he says, we're still putting human beings in cages. It is a mistake. Jim, what do you think? The facility needs to be closed. <laughs> you know, um, what, what Professor Fox said about the visit, I haven't been to Maine, but I was briefed by staff that went. I, I do want to call out the work that Abby and Dr. Fox is doing. This is groundbreaking work for corrections to ask an outside research group to come in and take a look at our culture. That is huge. And you may not think it's huge, but you're not sitting in the seat I'm sitting in looking out over the system. This is huge. And what's gonna come out of this is the ability for corrections to take a look at the enterprise change, about the way we interact every day with the folks that are in our custody. And um, I do think the facility in South Burlington needs to be closed. It wasn't built to do what it's doing now. Um, it doesn't serve the folks that are there well. Um, it's an intimidating environment. And I think that um, our staff there, that's there now, is working very hard to make it as, as pleasant as it can be in the environment that it's in. And the program that's going on there, I mean, Ashley's in there all the time, visiting, working on programming. She advocates. She has many of us on speed dial. She advocates for folks there, and, and, and that's good. Should we build another facility is the other part of the question. Or, or what other solution Or, or, or we should suggest? have a facility is yeah. the other part of the question. Mm -hmm. um, I hear the conversation about we shouldn't have a facility, and I don't know enough about it to comment on it, but what I do know is that the conditions that we ask folks not only to work in, but folks to live in, in South Burlington are not dignified and it doesn't give um, human dignity to the folks that are there. And we need to do something about it. If, if there is consensus around closing the jail, why hasn't it happened? Uh, week four and a half, I don't, no, I, no I'm, <laughs> listen, this is, I, I, people have asked me why I did this. This is a great position in to be in an interim role, believe me. Um, you know, Alan, I, I think um, state government and policy development moves slow. I got, you know, 40 years experience in state government. It moves slow. Conversations happen slow. I'm not saying it's right. I'm telling them what the reality is. But I, I doubt that you will talk to anybody inside corrections or in the legislative process that would not agree that that building is a problem. I think the next question has to be answered, and the conversation started um, within the last week and a half, two weeks, um, and it will continue. Uh, we have an RFP out um, to take a look at some planning around do we do another facility and where would it be, and what would it look like. What I know about corrections to this point in time, if we do another facility, it's not for detention. It's for programming. And there's a big difference besides you know, the, you know we, heard, we heard the opening comments about what prisons looked like, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago. And there were straight up detention facilities. And that's not where we are in our thought process. That's not where the state is. So whatever that facility looks like, it's gotta be, if it's built, and a decision's made to build that, 
It's got to be built for programming. And it's got to be built for support. And it's got to be built for taking good inmates to good citizens. And that, that I think, is the conversation. And I don't know where it's going to go. And I don't know if it'll be settled before I leave in May. Hmm. Ashley, what kind of programming do, do people need? Programming in the community. <laughs> and what does that mean? What's programming? So uh, having been an inmate, uh, specifically at CRCF, I can tell you that the best programming in the world is not, did not change me, did not make me successful. The, the success that is created in the community, with my children, with the people that care about me, in my town, able to you know, work with my neighbors and go to the grocery store. The reality is, is that there's healing that needs to happen, right? The true meaning of justice is when all parties in an act of harm can heal. The victim, the person that perpetrated the act of harm, and the community around them. And that's what we need to create. <laughs> So if we spent as much money as we will spend on new programs in jails, they will still be jails. I don't care what you pay in them. I don't care how many windows are there. But if we invested that money in community-based alternatives to incarceration, in mental health, in housing, in public education, and down the line, we would have better outcomes than we'll have in the best programming in a prison. <laughs> Well, I don't know, Alan. We're, they're, they're just burning through these questions. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, Jim, I, I, I got a question about unions, you know. Um, I, I, I know that the VSEA um, has a certain opinion about how workers should be protected, and there's some tension there about standards of conduct, potentially, and drug testing and that sort of thing. And I wonder if you could talk about that. Um, you know, what... How do you see this? What is the union's role in pushing for prison reforms? You know, Ann and I, and you and I were talking about this before, right? Um, I have a great deal of experience of working with unions through the years, um, from my state police days to uh, when I was the police chief in Rutland, to running the police academy, uh, to now being the interim commissioner of corrections. I have a, date, I, I have a great deal of respect for unions. Um, they represent their employees, um, and um, there is tension. That's a normal tension. But, you know, the interesting thing for me, um, when, you, when you finally get down to sit down with whatever unions I've ever dealt with over the years, you know, and you break bread or you have a cup of coffee, they really want the same thing I want as a leader. And I mentioned this earlier. I, I want my staff to be safe. I want to make a good living. I, I, I don't want them exposed to situations that traumatize them because they get traumatized in their work. Um, I want to make sure if they are traumatized that there's programming for them that supports them. That's a problem in corrections right now. Um, and and I, I will work on this before I leave. Uh, I, I will get them more clinical support based upon the kind of work they do in the stress they're under. And so the interesting thing is is that I want the same thing the union wants, but sometimes, um, and again, being in an interval, I can say this without any, any harm coming my way. Sometimes there's a lot of grandstanding that goes on. And yeah. you know, in this case, I've heard representatives from the union um, blame the leadership of corrections for every problem that goes on inside corrections. I see the disciplinary cases and I issue discipline. And I can assure you that's not, not the case. And so I think in a relationship with unions, it's really about having an understanding about what our roles are in following the rules of a contract and making sure employees are taken care of and that we as management aren't heavy handed, but unions are not overusing processes that weren't meant to be overused. And having an understanding of how best to create a workforce that does the work we're charged to do, which is do no more harm to the folks that we're dealing with. So it's not an easy situation. Sometimes some unions are easier than others. Um, I've, I've had, uh, in my history, I've, I've actually had a union 
ask for a criminal investigation of me. Uh -huh. I've been sued by unions. Um, I think that's more than it needs to be to get the job done, because at the end of the day, we want the same thing. Should there be drug testing? I, I know the Secretary Smith has, has mentioned that. I think that's something we need to talk with the union about. Um, I think you only ask for certain things from the union that are intrusive, if in fact there's a basis to ask for that intrusiveness. Um, now, when it comes to accountability, uh, you know, I'm huge on accountability. I know, I've heard, I've read the stories. Ashley and I have had a couple long conversations about what advocates perceive as the lack of accountability in the system. And I think that um, they, they have a legitimate concern because I'll go back to what I said to Alan earlier about corrections being insular. Sometimes we get so insular and as we're attacked more, we get more insular. And that leads people to believe that there's something behind the wall. And I don't, I, you know, I, I don't mean behind the wall, Joe, <laughs> but hidden behind the wall that we're trying to hide. And I think we have to be more transparent about what we do and how we do business and what, what we're about. So people have a better understanding that we're part of a bigger system that everybody needs to work on to get to these places that have been described tonight. And the union plays a big role in that. Speaking of transparency, you had to use that word. Uh, <laughs> I probably, so I, I know, do, do you want me to ask me the question? No, no, I, I, I just wondered about, you know, public records. And, uh, you know, Alan and I have been fighting for a few records here and there. Uh, and, uh, you know, should the public have more information about grievances and, grievances and complaints, and especially complaints from correctional officers against other correctional officers about misconduct and that kind of thing, which is what we're seeking essentially in the Edward Adams case. Do you, do you think that there should be more public disclosure of some of these things that come up? I'm gonna go back to my, my law enforcement community policing um, mythology of the way I think. We should be as transparent as we legally can be. And there'll be debates over what should be released and what shouldn't be released. Uh, an interpretation of what the Freedom of Information Law is. But I do think any organization, including corrections, does itself harm when it's not transparent. Hmm. When you get into personnel issues, it's very tricky area to work in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because you're balancing those issues. You know, Alan knows this from my Rutland days, the Supreme Court decision, which is the test, which is the test of what the public needs to know and what the public doesn't need to know yeah. is a Rutland City Police Department case. Mm -hmm. So I live that, I understand it. Um, I just think we need to be more transparent as an organization. Mm -hmm. And I, I kid with a couple of, you know, the, of, of the staff members. You know, what we do in corrections is not, we don't carry the nuclear bomb coat around with us. <laughs> I mean, we don't, I mean, what we do is serve the public. So I, I do think that we can do a better job at that. I can't talk about that case because it's litigation. But yes, of course. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I, that's where I am on it. So Thank you. Ashley, should the grievances from inmates be available to the press or the public to look at and I think see? it should be up to them. If uh, it's their records, which I know when we uh, had this discussion previously, many of the women would be happy uh, to have the press and advocates view their grievances and look at the, the responses they've gotten. Uh, so I think it should be up to them. If it's their records, it, it should be up to them if they're released. How would that work? I mean, basically, essentially, the women are being blocked from having a certain amount of copies of their grievances. They're having to request copies. You can only go a year back. So even when we went inside and got access to them uh, to be able to share that information, uh, whether it be with Paul or Vermont Digger or, or whoever uh, was requesting the information and they were willing to share it, there was roadblocks put up. So uh, we've still been able to do it, clearly, because you've read about it, uh, but it's, it's been increasingly difficult. And so we asked the same question, which is, if it's my information, I should be able to say you can see it or no, you can't. And 
you know, the reality is, is, is the women and the men and everybody in our correction system has a, has a right to uh, have their information shared if they so choose and, and also to keep it protected. But it's an accountability tool, right? Because the reality is, is if the grievances were, were viewed in mass, then there would be some accountability issues. So you see that as a check on the system? I see that as the, there's obvious uh, concern as to not sharing those grievances. So mm -hmm. that leads me to assume, uh, having seen some of the grievances, because women brought them to me, uh, which I then shared some with the ACLU's legal team, um, there, there's concern there. There's concerns in how grievances are handled, the process itself, how they're answered, what's done with them after the fact, how long it takes, uh, even up to the judicial process. So um, I will say that I think the grievance policy is being looked at, which is a, a much needed review and change. Terrific, Jimmy, you wanna yeah, say you something? Know, my, I can't disagree with much of what Ashley said based on mm -hmm. what I know. Um, we have to take a look at our grievance process. Ashley and I have talked about this um, and I'm talking with staff about implementing a process where um, we involve the superintendents in a regular conversation about the state of grievances that are coming from their facilities. So it's on our radar. It's, it is something I'm gonna get to before I transition out as an interim. And I'm not saying we're gonna have the perfect answer, but um, uh, procedural justice is important. It's important to have people let their voice be heard. And that's a very important process to take some of the stress out of faci facilities because it is a point of stress for folks in the facilities, no doubt about it. Well, we haven't gotten to this issue yet, um, but I wonder, Sarah, if you could talk a little bit about bail reform and if you think that's necessary and what that might look like. Um, it's definitely necessary. I know that the legislature has done a lot um, last year, I think it was last session, they did a lot to limit the number of cases or the types of cases that state's attorneys can request bail on. And it has, I don't have the data, but my belief, at least based on my experience in Chittenden County, is that it has dropped pretty dramatically. Um, I think that there are still too many people being held um, pre-detention. I think there's still more work we can do. And I also think that um, a big part that's left out of it is the judiciary. Um, we have a judge in Chittenden County that holds people on bail even when we're not requesting it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's completely, it, there's, there isn't as much check and balance on our judiciary as there is more and more on state's attorneys and prosecutors, which is great. And I think that that's another level that really needs to be looked at, um, it took a lot of, even when the first came, you know, the newest legislation first came in, um, there was a lot of pushback from law enforcement on not being able to ask for bail on a lot of these cases. And it took some time, but after a little while, it just, it becomes the norm. And frankly, we were asking for bail um, in Chittenden County and in, around the state for public safety issues, which by, by our constitution was not allowed. Um, for years we were doing it. Um, and you know, our, I see some of our public defenders in the room, they were telling us we can't do it. They were telling the judges we couldn't do it and we were continuing to do it. And so I think that a lot of it was just really educating the prosecutors and the courts about what the Vermont Constitution really allows bail to be used for and then actually doing that. And that in itself just limited the number of cases that we were asking for bail in. But again, I do think that we're still asking for it too much, and I think that um, from my experience, Chittenden County is just different in general than a lot of the other counties, and the other counties are still getting away with asking for bail in cases they shouldn't be, and judges are imposing it. How widely used is electronic monitoring for people um, pre-trial in Chittenden County? Not at all. Should it be? Is it an option that it's not an option right now to use electronic monitoring unless somebody is sentenced or if they're on probation and they're um, pending a violation of probation, but otherwise it is not allowed. And I would not support using it um, pre-detention. I mean, it's still, or pre-sentence. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's still, 
bail should be used, or bail in our case is used for risk of flight, and it's not used for public safety. So using a monitoring system before we even know whether the person has shown up, I, I, would, I would not support that. I think it's still a lot of wasted resources that could be used on getting that individual into the whatever services they need. Well, we still have a little bit of time. You all are very efficient. <laughs> Um, I, I wonder if each of you could talk about how you would envision the system 10 years from now. What, what, if you could wave a very magic wand, what, what would it look like? Maybe we could start with Ashley and, and work our way around. So this is the Harry Potter wand question that I ask uh, other stakeholders that I work with often. Uh, I would envision a community where we respond to each other in the ways in which we harm each other. Uh, with compassion and dignity and respect, uh, that we create communities that are thriving, where people's basic needs are met, where uh, families are not being torn apart and communities are not being ripped apart by a whole myriad of issues that we currently face and seriously underfund in this state. Um, and I think that I would like to see I mean, the end of mass incarceration. If I had a magic wand, you know, we would not be uh, sending people to jail every single second of every day like we do currently. And we do it here, too. I mean, Vermont is not unique from family separation. Families are being separated at the border, and P.S., they're being separated right now as we speak uh, in our state, in our towns, down the street from our house. Uh, addiction touches everyone uh, across race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, but I would hope in 10 years, if I had a magic wand, it would be, unfortunately, sorry, Jim, the end of corrections for the most part. <laughs> no apology to me. Actually. I wasn't really sorry. No, I know you weren't. Um, and, um, <laughs> I guess I envision um, an aligned system where all the pieces of the system are aligned with an agreed upon outcome for individuals who cause harm. And that the system is aligned to the point where um, we're only holding the people in jail that need to be there. And that there is more community-based support, not only um, you know, support in programming that is, um, is well-researched and documented, that it's not one-off programs, um, especially around the issues of substance abuse and mental health um, and, and folks that have been exposed to trauma um, and how we deal with them in the communities and that communities are supportive of that type of community-based programming. Uh, and I hate to keep giving my my friends in Rutland a call out, but that we had more project visions in the state that are willing to take those risks on folks in the community with the support from the Department of Corrections to make those folks um, able to be able to succeed, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And that there are success stories that get told about um, folks such as Ashley, who had an opportunity um, to make a difference and I don't think we have enough of that right now. And I do think the folks in the Department of Corrections recognize that and they want to move towards that model. Um, there's this saying that I've heard um, that we need to distinguish between who we're truly afraid of and who we're just mad at. And I think <clears throat> if I could envision it in 10 years, uh, we would make that distinction and we would not incarcerate people that, we're, that just offend us or that we're mad at because they stole something from us, or um, but that you know, if we if we need to incarcerate, we would reserve it for the the truly um, those that we truly can't have among us. Um, I'm not sure there are any, by the way, but if if so, that's what it would be. Um, I would also. You know, as Jim said, having an aligned system, it, you know, corrections has to take whoever is sent to them by the courts. And so, yes, we could make our prisons more humane and all that, but the entire process needs to be data-driven. And 
I think a judge, if they're going to ask for a sentence, they need to do a co they need to provide a cost benefit analysis. Um, what is your reason for incarcerating this person? What is your uh, rationale for your expectation that this is going to do the public any good? Um, and I think prosecutors also. I mean, we are very fortunate to have a, a very smart and forward-thinking prosecutor, but there is, you know, what is referred to as geographic injustice. So, uh, not all counties treat these things the same way. Um, so, prosecutors also need to be able to justify their case with a cost-benefit analysis um, if they're asking for any kind of jail time. That said, through all this process, what I would love to see is instead of people being sent to prison, send them to college, you know? Send them to, um, uh, it, you know, sentence them to college or sentence them to, um, you know, a, tr a trade, you know, like a, to become a plumber's apprentice if they're not college material, you know. So that could be um, a diversion for anybody who uh, needs a skill. I mean, a lot of times, or, or you know, in this, this college could also have um, drug treatment beds. It could have caseworkers. I mean, we need to turn this into a social work enterprise, right, um, rather than a simply safety and security enterprise. So prisons as we know it would be would not exist in 10 years in, if I had a magic wand, so. Yeah. I'll uh, try to be brief. I think that my very short answer would be that I envision a world in which everybody collaborates but also stays in their own lanes. And I feel like if the Department of Mental Health, you know, most of the cases that we deal with, there's some, uh, there's some evidence of trauma or mental health or substance use, and that all then gets put on the, the criminal justice system to fix. And if so much more of that was just dealt with in the Department of Mental Health or within Howard Center or any other organizations that work in that field, using more community groups like Mercy Connections and our restorative justice panels that allow for the community to be involved and for the community to sort of own their own members. Um, I'm a huge advocate of restorative justice. If we could have that literally take over for the criminal justice system, I think that it would be, we would all be so much better off. And I think it goes to Kathy's, like, are we, are we, we're just mad at people. But when you actually ask victims, people think that, peop that people who want to reform the system don't care about victims when in fact it's, you know, could not be further from the truth. And that the victims that I work with every day, when you really sit down and ask them what they want, it's essentially a pamphlet for restorative justice. They just want accountability, they want to be heard, and they want that person to do something to, to heal that harm, which jail doesn't do. And frankly, guilty verdicts don't do. If you ever go to a, a change of plea, the defendant doesn't actually have to do all that much. Um, they, they stand up there and they answer a couple of questions, yes or no, and they say guilty. They don't have to really account for what happened and what harm was caused where restorative justice does. So that would be my, my very short answer, people staying in their own lanes, using community organizations, and using the criminal justice system as a very, very, very last resort. And I would love for every single time that state's attorneys are up for election, they're contested. <laughs> I'm less patient than Anne, so she said 10 years. In a year, I mean, are we going to be sitting here a year from now having the same conversation, or do you envision there being changes within a year? For me? Anybody. I, 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 think, I, think, I think changes are happening now, and I see changes happening in four and a half weeks inside corrections. Probably not to the satisfaction of a lot of folks, but I think a year from now, based on the work that's being done at the legislature right now um, and where we are in our thinking, because I tend to agree with, you know, I said a long time ago, even law enforcement is now an arm of social work. And um, there, there, there's a lot of damaged folks out there um, that need help. And so I see the system changing now. And I think a year, two years from now, it's going to look a lot different. I don't think we'll be sitting here having the conversation about technical violations on furlough. 
I don't think we'll have that conversation. I think it'll be volumes. Do you agree, Ashley? Do you think? Oh, we're, we're not going to be having the same conversations in a year. <laughs> I, uh, uh, otherwise, I sorely <laughs> failed at my job. Uh, so, you know, I hope that we are much further in a year than any of us think, but it's going to take some work on the legislature's part, uh, including funding the things we need them to fund in the community so that we can make some, some large changes. I think that recommendations have been made that were on the conservative side that could be strengthened and, and go further. And I think that the work is not done until the work is done. Anyone else on that comment? I, I mean, I can definitely, I feel confident that in Chittenden County, a lot of stuff can be done in a year. I've been the state's attorney for three years and I feel like a lot has got accomplished. You just, you need community support to do the things that everybody in this room probably agrees need to be done. And again, I can only control what I can do in Chittenden County, but I think that I am lucky that I feel a lot better about doing it because of the incredible organizations that we have in Chittenden County. We're, we're very resource heavy. And so I think that there does need to be a lot more accountability around the state, but we also need to make sure that those counties and those communities have the community supports that they need to make those decisions. But I do think that it can happen um, maybe like a year and a half or <laughs> two years. Oh, 18 months, 24 yeah. months. Well, um, thank you all for, for your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're going to hear from uh, Dick Sears and Celine Colburn, and then we're done. So we've got... Five to ten more minutes, folks. Um, thank you again, panelists. It was great. So we have um, Senator Dick Sears and Representative Celine Colburn. They're going to close the evening with a short legislative update on criminal justice reform. Uh, Dick Sears is a Democratic member of the Vermont State Senate. He represents Bennington County, and he chairs the Senate Committee on, Ju on the Judiciary. And Celine Colburn is a representative from Chittenden County, and she's on the House Judiciary Committee. Dick's going to start first because, as Celine put it, he's got the bill first. So. This, I'll try this one. Is that better? That's great. Thank you. Um, I'll try to be, they asked me to be brief, but it's hard to be brief when you're a politician. Um, but I will say this, uh, the panel and our keynote speaker were great. We really appreciate that. Um, and we do need the community support uh, to move forward. Back in 2008, we started Justice Reinvestment One. And justice reinvestment is really a process led by the Justice Center out of New York City. They have offices in, in uh, uh, San Antonio, uh, no, excuse me, Austin, Texas, Seattle, Washington, New York, and Bethesda, Maryland. And they are a data-driven group who looks at strategies to reduce prison population with, without compromising public safety. And the idea behind it is justice reinvestment, and it's reinvesting monies that you save from incarcerating people into community-based programs. Um, in 2008, Vermont had the fastest growing prison population in the nation. We were, and our numbers are small. When I compare them to New York City, I mean, I get scared, but our numbers are relatively small. We've dropped by 500 over what was projected. So our out-of-state prison population in 2008 was at uh, 750. It's down to around 250 today. And at the same time, our crime rate is the second lowest in the nation behind Maine. So we accomplished both of those goals. 
Um, Jim mentioned there were 12,000 people on probation back then. That was one of the recommendations in Justice Reinvestment One, was to lower the probation. Uh, some of it was fairly easy. Some of them were actually dead, um, and they were still on the rolls. But uh, last February, Senator Tim Ash, who's uh, the president pro tem, gave the Senate Judiciary Committee a challenge. Eliminate the out-of-state population of 250. So that's what we were trying to move towards. And we start now with Justice Reinvestment II. Um, furlough was already discussed, so I won't get into that. But there are basically three strategies. One is to uh, use furlough, uh, basically get to a point where we pretty much eliminate furlough, reinstitute good time, which would be seven days a month. And the third strategy is to shorten probation terms by if somebody doesn't commit a violation of probation, they get a day for a day. So if you have a three-year sentence, a three-year probation uh, term to say five years to serve, you would work off that probation time and hopefully get off probation sooner. Um, the, sec the second step after we finish Justice Reinvestment one, uh, two will be a bill regarding mental health problems. And I loved what Sarah George said about that part of the, in, in her discussion a few minutes ago. Corrections is really the institutional last resort. And we know that many of the people that are held on detention and held on detention the longest have significant mental health issues. And that's a group that we really need to zero in on to reduce that number. So the third step will be some form of bail reform, hopefully this year, if not this year, next year, continuing the bail reform effort. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, it's not easy. Uh, you've got a lot of different uh, folks w working on a lot of different issues, and the House is, is going to be dealing with the women's prison, particularly, I believe, as will the Senate. Uh, we are, uh, some days get bogged down in the minutia, and, you know, whether or not, how soon on these technical revocations, but I wanted to mention, you know, on revocations from furlough, roughly 80% uh, of the people returned on furlough violations are for technical violations. They're not for new crimes. And that's an area that we will be particularly looking at and trying to improve. Um, and I think we're going to accomplish that this year. I have confidence in that. That's going to make a huge difference. The projection from the Justice Center is the three policies that I just mentioned, um, the probation, good time, and going to presumptive parole will reduce our prison population by about 135 people. Doesn't sound like a lot, but again, we're not dealing with a, you know, a huge number. It is going to take the communities recognizing that um, we have to hold people accountable, but do we have to hold them accountable with the highest possible penalty, which is taking away their freedom and placing them in jail? There are alternatives. Vermont's number one problem or number one crime is domestic violence. That we need to really deal with, and we can deal with that better in the communities than we have in the past. Um, and I'm confident that working on that with the Network Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault and with others and the Corrections Department, we can make progress. So I'm trying to do that within my five minutes. I've got 12 seconds left, so I'm going to turn it over to Selena. Turn it on, but thank you. Okay, so I'm uh, Selena Colburn, a representative here from Burlington. You're actually in my legislative district, so welcome. And um, I was going to talk about a couple of places in the legislature that are working on these issues. First, the Women's Caucus, and then the House Judiciary Committee. There's also a Corrections and Institutions Committee in the House that's that's digging into a lot of these issues as well. So the Women's Caucus for the last year has actually been 
looking at the issue of the, um, the women's facility in Chittenden County, looking at conditions there, looking at the facility um, itself, and trying to advocate for a number of improvements and reforms. I think there's a tension in the legislature as a whole, and you heard it a little bit on this panel tonight, between feeling a need, and there's a very real need to make immediate, direct improvements to the conditions that women are uh, living in at the facility, to, to the system itself. Um, but there are also many of us who, so there are some people who feel like it's critical to build a new facility and to not wait for this huge systematic reform. I think there are some of us, and I would count myself in this category, who agree with some of the things we heard from Ashley, from Sarah, from Kathy, from others tonight, saying that the time is now to just decarcerate and get people into completely different settings to embrace the Norway model, to embrace the community supports. Um, so that's the discussion we're having. I will say, Commissioner Baker, um, spent a bunch of time with the Women's Caucus uh, about a week ago and really appreciated that and he was very candid about um, the scale of reform that he's trying to institute there and that's needed. But there was one thing that concerned me and I just have to put it out there as a call to action to all of us, which is, you know, on December 4th, we saw Paul Heinz's article about the serious conditions there, the sexual harassment and assault that women had been facing. Um, on the 13th, we saw an article noting that there was no independent reporting mechanism for the women there. That is still true today. All of the reports go directly into the Department of Co Corrections, and I hope you'll join me on calling for an immediate independent reporting mechanism for the women in that facility. So uh, on the House Judiciary side of things, we're eagerly awaiting the bills that Senator Sears is working on. Um, we are also looking at the results of another um, body that has made some recommendations around sentencing reform. So a sentencing commission has been working for the last year plus. Um, and they've recommended a classification system, so crimes in Vermont sort of get created um, over time. They can be very scattershot, and there's not necessarily a lot of consistency um, or to, to you know how one crime lines up against another. And so we're trying to, because we have some crimes that are 100 plus years old. Um, so we're looking at a classification scheme starting to really dig in with property crimes, and that would have the net impact of just reducing sentence time. That's one thing we're looking at. We're also looking at data collection across the state so we can better understand who is being incarcerated and why. I think the team that looked at the justice reinvestment work really actually had a serious problem just obtaining data about our criminal justice system. I have filed a bill last year about that, working with ACLU and others, because it's critical to our work on, on racial justice as it intersects with the criminal justice system. Um, so that's something we're looking at in House Judiciary. And then I would say also we um, are looking at just like what really needs to even be a crime. Um, and, and I've introduced bills to decriminalize, following Sarah's lead and others, decriminalize small possession amounts of buprenorphine, non-prescribed buprenorphine. I introduced a bill this year to decriminalize sex work, and I'm happy to say we're making some real progress on that issue. Um, this session, we actually passed a related bill out of our committee today. My district mate, um, Brian Chena, is here. He had a really interesting bill that would decriminalize peyote and psychedelic mushrooms, and um, and we're looking at, I've continued to introduce bills, defelonizing drug possession. So the, I think we have to have these aspirational, harder questions too about not just how do we reform and improve what's on the books, but how do, what, what does, does not need to be a crime, right? And because no one is actually being harmed except the person who's engaging in that behavior themselves, and sometimes not even that. So um, that's my report. And the final thing I would say, if I can take 10 more seconds, 
is just one observation, whether it's our work in the legislature or our work here in a space like this. One thing I noticed about this panel is that there were nine of us on this stage, all told, and I don't presume to know everybody's history, but I think only two people spoke about their experience um, being incarcerated, having direct interactions with a criminal justice system. And if we want to answer the question, whether it's in the legislature or in our community conversations about how to fix the jail, we have to center the voices of people who have experience with being incarcerated, people who are formerly incarcerated, and people who work in the system. So let's all pledge to do better on that. Thank you, Selena and Dick. So this uh, is the end of our program. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank our sponsors, ACLU of Vermont and the UVM College of Arts and Science. We hope to see you Tuesday, February 18th to talk about public records in Montpelier. Thank you again, have a good night.